And ladies and gentlemen, I'm Leaf Miss Rhyme, and I'm a Schmo. And I'm Gyro, and I'm a Schmo. And uh, welcome to the Two Schmo Show, the only show on the internet that's comfortable with dead air. How's your week been, this Cairo? I mean, uh, how's your yeah, week been? Yeah. This? <laughs> you know, back, back and forth, a little of both worlds. Oh no, no, that's a attempt at a a pun. Um, but yeah, no, it, it you know makes back right. It's fine. Yeah, can't, can't complain too much. Um, got my uh, blood tithe to the Disney overlords made once again. So I've got some catching up to do with some Marvel stuff uh, and some Doctor Who stuff since somehow that fucking happened. I still don't quite understand it. Have I told but, you the story behind that? Yeah, you did. Okay. I, I still, it's like, it's still wild to me. I don't like it, but if it's what had to be done, I will live with this. Yeah. I'm glad it happened, right? It seems like it was for the better in the end. But, uh, Still just weird to think about. It's always weird to think that Doctor Who is technically funded by British people's tax. <laughs> yeah. Doctor Who It'll is socialist work. television. I kid. I kid. Please, right-winging people who listen to this, stay away from my quotes. Let's... Start if we can, though. No, well, no, we'll work our way into it because we got we got better stuff to talk about than the usual shit. And if we can, I'd like to start talking about Loki. Oh, sure, why not? Specifically, Loki season one because it is still so damn good. I got the the Disney Plus back, so. I uh, started watching Loki season two, and I'm only four of the six episodes there is. My you know, opinion on it could change, of course, once I finish watching the rest of it. But uh, before I did that, I went and just rewatched the first season because it's been a little over a year now, I think, since I last did. And I was very glad with how well it still holds up because there's a lot of science fiction in particular that kind of you know it loses its luster a bit when you know the twists that are coming mm -hmm. and i was very pleasantly surprised that that wasn't the case where um the jokes that they write in are like genuinely funny in a way that a lot of marvel stuff isn't you know it tends to lean more smarmy and quippy and even knowing that some of these jokes are, are you know coming going to be coming up they're still really good and I was, you know, pleasantly surprised by that. Um, music in particular is what really got me back on board with it. There is something I need to, like, find the right terminology to describe it. But the specific instrumentation that they use in the, the main Loki theme in particular is just so damn good. I don't know what it is about it, but it just works. If you told me 10 years ago, the most consistent part of the MCU 10 years in the future would be involve Owen Wilson. I probably wouldn't mm -hmm. believe you. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. And he's really good. Yeah. It's, it's cool. It's such a cool thing to see him continue to do so well in a role. That's very atypical for, his usual affair. And that's the thing that Marvel continues to excel at still is finding these people who are both big name and people you've probably never heard of and being like, yep, this is the perfect person to play this character the way that we're going to write him. Oh, speaking of big name, I heard the man Kihi Kwan is in season two. Is that correct? Uh, Yes. He, I don't know if, do you, do you, have you seen it by chance? I guess not, if you're asking. No, I've um, not seen it, but I do plan on watching it. I keep forgetting it, that I have it. 
not a huge spoiler. Uh, he plays a character called uh, or o- Ober. Ouroboros. <laughs> yes, thank you. I can never remember if it's like O R B or O B R. Hmm. Uh, but yes, Ouroboros. He plays a character named that, but you know, with like the Mobius and stuff, is a bit on the nose, but it's fun all the same. Um. Yeah, he's great. He's, you know, uh, in a bit of a, like, supporting-ish role, but it is uh, good, like, it's like a, the correct way to make a sort of quirkier comic relief character, is how I would put it. We have, like, the one, I don't know, so I can figure out her name, um, in Thor 1, uh, Darcy Lewis. Hmm who started in Thor 1 and has cropped up a bunch of different times since then and plays that sort of, like, quirky, kind of comic relief, tech support kind of character. Yeah. And I feel like the way that her character has been written a lot of the times, and in particular the most recent appearances of it, have been unflattering and not very well done. Just at, like, a a concept level where... It feels almost like a, like practically disrespectful for her as an actor to continue to be forced into like like it's been twenty like uh, fifteen years now, right? Mm-hmm. And the characters hardly changed at all, and that feels just kind of like just not not real. I feel that with like several MCU characters, especially like the yeah. minor ones. Yeah, like Wong, for example. Mm-hmm. Granted, yeah. Wong is more developed than Darcy, I would say. He gets a little bit more, but yeah. it feels like for her, if you like look at her role in Thor 1 and like her role in, I think WandaVision was the last thing that I saw her in, mm-hmm. it feels like it's the exact same person. Yeah. And that shouldn't be the case. And part of that may be that, you know, we have uh, Orberus and they're only, you know, in their first appearance here and probably going to be their only appearance um, just because the whole loki stuff is pretty contained so far and it seems like they're not branching out too much from that with the second season which i think is good um but it does seem like it's doing that character better in that they seem like they have a lot more agency right Mm -hmm. they're not just a sidekick they are a person supporting the main characters I will say, though, I'm sorry, uh, it is very, very unfortunate seeing Jonathan Majors in this. And (laughs) I am curious to see what they do in the last two episodes, because uh, there's um, a bit of a twist at the end of the episode I just watched Mm -hmm. that uh, sort of opens up a door for them, I guess you could say, to sidestepping the uh the jonathan majors problem we'll call it <laughs> the majors issue to just, yeah i'll be really curious to see how they work around that because up to this point he's been uh you know all the kang variant stuff right it's mm-hmm. like kind of the whole point you can't really you know ignore it so i don't know it'll be interesting to see what they do it amazes me how poorly Jonathan Majors' big step into the MCU, yeah. you know, just like aged like milk. Yeah. Two, two steps forward, three steps back into jail. Yeah, pretty much. And it's really fucking unfortunate that he's such a piece of shit because he's a damn good actor. Isn't that like the biggest waste of all this? That's so frustrating. Did you? We've um, been waiting for like literally years for there to be like, okay, what's gonna come after Thanos? Yeah, and you can really tell that they were setting this position up to be that. And I don't know. We'll see what they do. I, I think they could probably just recast the character, but it's a damn shame. Still, did you hear some of the people that are considering for the King recast? No. Are uh, they gonna get uh, Terrence Howard back? Oh. Please tell me that. Wouldn't that be a million times better? 
No, no, no. We didn't recast him. He was actually a Kang variant in the first Iron Man movie. Okay, I need to find this article. Okay. Uh, that is not the actor I originally saw uh, considered, but I guess we will roll with this. Uh, apparently, Coleman uh, Domingo is being yeah. considered for the recast. I don't know who this person is. I do not know who this person is either. He's in the the Color Purple remake. Oh, I do know who this person is because I have seen Euphoria. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, he's actually very good in that show. Good. He would actually be a good king, so I am fully behind this. He's definitely got like because they make the the really obvious uh, nose joke like two or three times throughout the series, and he's got that going. The Kangs compliment each other on their noses. Is that really a thing? Oh yeah, I don't know if they're going to continue to make it be a thing. I don't know if that was intentional in this, but yeah, in the uh, in the first season they do it. I think twice, but at least once for sure. Where Kang talks about meeting his alternate selves for the first time and complimenting each other on their hair and noses. That's really fucking funny. Because, you know, it's it's a very prominent feature of Jonathan Majors. He's got a very wide uh, nostril, right? Yeah. Well, Coleman Domingo, I am not familiar with them, but I will definitely uh, take a word on it. Seems, seems like he's been in the business for quite a while. So. You know who Kihi Kwan would be really good as in Marvel, but unfortunately that character's already been cast? What's that? I could see Kihi Kwan doing a very good Hulk. Mm, maybe. You, I don't know. You don't think so? I'm not entirely convinced yet. Okay. Okay. Did you watch Everything Everywhere all at once? No, I haven't yet. That is why. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Very much recommend it. He steals mm. that movie. No, I uh, actually got it as a Christmas gift for my mom. So waiting to watch it with her because she was very interested to see it as well and didn't have a chance. That's very nice. Do you think we will ever get like an MCU renaissance? No. No? I don't. I think the moment has passed and we'll continue to see uh, things pop up here and there, right? Like Guardians 3. Yeah. It's a very good movie, right? Mm -hmm. One of the uh, best reviewed of last year and one of the best grossing of the last year. Um, but I think those are going to be more exceptions to the rule just because Marvel thrived on the continuity of it and getting rewarded for paying attention to and remembering past films. And I think they've missed the moment on that. I would imagine if you ask people like, did you watch Shang-Chi? Did you watch Eternals, Black Widow, the Marvels, the answer is going to be overwhelmingly no. Mm. Because these are new characters, and the movies are generally, you know, Shang-Chi was really good, uh, but everything after that, outside of Guardians and the Spider-Man movies, and like, even the Doctor Strange movie uh, fell victim to it to a bit, where they introduced new characters that just aren't particularly interesting. They, they don't do a good job of persuading the audience to care about them, you know? I like to refer to it as Age of Ultron Syndrome, mm -hmm. where you kind of... Yeah. It all feels like Age of Ultron. Mm-hmm. Hey, what is it? Uh, America Ferreira as in uh, Doctor Strange? Oh, yeah. Great character. Really cool ideas. But they pretty completely fail to make the character compelling to be something that you want to like figure out more about them right like what what is left to tell of their story at this point 
There's kind of nothing. It does feel like a lot of MCU characters are set up without motivation. Yeah. Because, like, I, I guess a good example would be, like, Doctor Strange, right? Mm-hmm. His movie isn't really anything, like, story-wise as much as, like, an introduction for the character. Mm-hmm. But by the end of that, you know his whole motivation going forward is always like, hey, I'm the Sorcerer Supreme. I got to go out. You know, I got to make sure everybody pretty much does their thing so nothing explodes. So when you have him in other movies, you know that's his direct motivation and he has a reason for being there. Whereas, you know, America, uh, Friera, uh, she comes yep. in and she has like a, a arc in the movie. Sure. But like after that, it's like. I'm just chilling now. I'm hanging out with Doctor Strange. I'm cool with yep. him. Yeah, we're we're buddies. And I I do get what you mean by that. like it doesn't have much interest past that. Mm-hmm. And I I do agree. I wish they would leave these more on open notes. I'm trying to pull it up here. I got a good one for uh, Phase Five here. But apparently Phase 5 is relatively recent-ish. Yeah. So I had to check 4 again. But I did find it... Oh, they did that one differently? Oh, that's annoying. Anyways, Phase 5, phase five has like a nice little chronological table here uh, that I thought was very funny to see because I've completely forgot about some of these two. Um, and I think, like, what better way to be a symbol of it than secret invasion. Ooh. Nick Fury also has a little bit of a motivation problem. Man. But I mean, it just for how much it cost for them to make secret invasion and it flopped so hard. It's just a pretty stark contrast. How much was the budget for secret invasion? Mm -hmm. According to Wikipedia, $212 million. Where did that go? Yeah. Yeah, and this is the thing that's wild for me, is that that's $70 million more than they spent on Loki. What did you spend that money on? The AI. Samuel Jackson just cost $70 million now? I don't get it. Bringing it back to Loki, though. Oh, yes. Please go on. It's season two is definitely like if if Loki season one is a nine out of ten for me so far, season two is like a a 7.5 or an eight. It's still very good, but Mm -hmm. it doesn't hit the same highs. Uh, And that could change. I think a lot of it is that at this point, uh, the mystery of it has been peeled away largely and it has to rely on more of the uh, drama writing rather than the strict science fiction of it. And it's not as strong, but there is still some pretty uh, compelling elements to it. And in particular, um, that's what is something I wanted to look up and I completely forgot to. I wanted to check who did uh, the writing and cinematography to see if it was the same. So they had multiple different directors, but it looks like it was largely written by Eric Martin. Um, oh, why did it do that? Why didn't it take me to... That's strange. Anyways, that's not what I want to do. I was curious if it's the same people who wrote it, because uh, season two, at times, um, leans in in a way that's like almost horror-esque with the way that it shot. They do a really good job using uh, the the space that is the TVA mm-hmm. to have these, you know, tight, long corridors, dark lighting, glow, kind of just inherent to the, the setting. And it makes for these scenes that are very grim and tense and very easy to put... Uh, an object or an event into that scene and not fully explain it until later in the series because it's all time travel and stuff. And 
have it come off as a horror thing when it's really just something that's normally happening, right? Like a coat hung up in the corner of the room that's all shadowy and looks like a person. Okay, yeah. And it's an oversimplification, but they use that very effectively in ways that I found to be like genuinely startling at times. Um, and they play around with some of the ideas that could come about from an organization like the TVA in some ways that are less uh, horror, but are still horrifying. And that was very interesting to see. Just playing with ideas is uh, very fun. I think that's a big problem with a lot of the recent Marvel stuff that we've seen, right? Where you have like secret invasion where it's like, yeah, this is more of Captain Marvel. It's like, what if Captain Marvel had a six episode TV series tacked onto the end of it? Yeah. Um, and it's the kind of thing like you kind of need a gimmick, right? And I need to watch it. It's going to be on my list now that I have Disney plus again, but the Marvels I've heard relatively positive things about because it kind of has a gimmick where you want to see how they use the idea that they have in creative ways. And that feels lacking. Where they're, they have no problem telling a story or an action scene, but it's not compelling because it's just things happening. The fact that it's set in the Marvel Universe alone isn't enough to, to carry it like it used to be because there's no more of that guarantee that watching this thing today is going to be paid off eventually down the road. Now, or what if, if it does, then yeah. you're going to care when that happens. I was just about to bring up that point. Like, what if yeah. we get to Secret Wars and here we are with, like, everything coming back and everything really mattered after all? Right. I think a good example is, like, a comparison is, like, Thor 2, right? Yeah. Terrible movie, but if you watched it, you were rewarded when it came back around again for the larger plot things that it cared about and told you you know it's still wild to me that christopher eccleston was in thor 2 yep dude's prolific christopher eccleston is a good actor but that movie did not do any justice for him nope no <laughs> definitely not <laughs> It's amazing. He got so into the role. I actually did believe he was some no-name actor who couldn't act. <laughs> Christopher Eccleston, I know you're listening. Please, please don't don't take that to heart. Ninth Doctor is one of my favorites. Thank you. Did they have a Doctor Who reference? Because that wasn't that long after his stint. I can't remember. Like I, I, I would question. I think the number of people who have seen Thor two more than one and a half times is like you're getting into ninety ninth percentiles at that point. Did you know that Doctor Who is canon in uh, Marvel? I'm not surprised. Like the Doctor is actually in the Marvel multiverse somewhere, if I remember right. Oh, like that. Like that surprises me. I I would have expected like the TV show to exist within but like the actual doctor i believe so there's like a multiverse earth where he is a factor very funny because they were gonna like so the bbc gave marvel <laughs> the license to print doctor yeah. who comics so marvel of course had to fucking go off the hinge with that and oh they, of course there's like a scrapped pilot pay page some kind of cover or something like that if i remember right which was basically like Doctor Strange meets the Doctor, but it never got printed because the BBC said no when they pitched the idea. That's, but... that's the correct response. <laughs> I got to find this because it's a bizarre image. And this was like back in the 80s when neither of these were popular. So imagine how that would have gone. Yep. Yeah. I I would not be surprised if they continue to push for something like that. That just seems like... Now that Disney has a hand in both? 
I don't know. I'd put it this way, right? <laughs> the Doctor Who as like a franchise has already collaborated with Magic the Gathering. Yeah. And we know Marvel is going to be doing the same as well. So they're clearly open to exposing themselves to that level of brand mixing in a way that they weren't before. I will say this, right? Yeah. We live in a great time to be a guy who got beaten up in middle school. Mm Mm-hmm. I cannot find this page to save my life. I'm so upset. Oh, well. Also, apparently Marvel only acknowledges up to the eighth doctor in their universe. Only the eighth. Up to the eighth. Interesting. That's a very odd cutoff. Well, it makes sense when I guess, you consider I guess that the reboot does. didn't happen when these comics were coming out. Yeah. Is the Doctor going to San Francisco and getting immediately shot, Candon, in the Marvel Universe? It has to be, because that's how the Eighth Doctor happens. (laughs) (laughs) That's fucked up. Where were you, Ant-Man? Why didn't you stop it? God. Because he's in San Francisco. Oh, that's right. Ant-Man let the, the Seventh Doctor, Seventh and a Half Doctor, get shot. Well, okay, so that took place back in the 90s. I don't think he yeah. had the Ant-Man suit back then. Well, no, he would have. He would have. Damn. Um, Scott He Lane maybe tripping. wouldn't have, but yeah. uh, the Doctor would have. Yeah. Yeah. The original Ant-Man, yeah. God, we're so nerdy. This is a good episode of the Two Smokes Show. I'm so <laughs> glad I haven't cried yet today. <laughs> Well, it's not too late. No. No. The Apple Vision Pro released this Friday. No. For $3,500. Have you seen any of the reviews of it? I'm curious. Like the actual reviews. I have not. Because to be frank, I think it's a stupid device that does Mm -hmm. nothing. I wouldn't go. I think it's a very stupid device. I don't think it does nothing. If... It, it it's I find the whole thing fascinating and very emblematic of Apple as a whole, right? Allegedly, they have already sold two hundred thousand of them. Which is almost I did the math before. It, it, it's like it's almost a billion dollars. <laughs> like overnight. Um And I have seen uh, a couple of reviews, nothing like especially in-depth, right? Because it's like, it's an Apple product. You don't care about the technical specifications when you're talking about Apple products. And I kind of hate that. Because as a piece of technology, it is remarkable what it's able to do. The pixels are uh, sub, what was it, sub micrometer? Which is less than one one thousandth of a millimeter. What? I think. Or maybe it's like less than one one hundredth. It's something absurdly small. It's genuinely, technologically, incredibly impressive. And it makes sense why it has a price to match that. But at the same time, it doesn't make sense as a product. And I've seen some very good comparisons to this, to the Google Glass. Um, which is kind of obvious, right, at like a surface level. But seeing people who are in the tech space today and were in the tech space when the Google Glass released uh, is really interesting to see that comparison. I think it's fascinating that it released after CES, which is like the big tech show of the year. Because uh, Linus Tech Tips was, of course, you know, big tech reviewer on YouTube was talking about it on his podcast this Friday. Um, and was saying how when Google glass released at the CES that followed that 
everybody had Google Glass on. Not like a few people or people doing like demonstrations for it. It was endemic to that event because it was the cool tech thing to have at the time, even though it was fifteen hundred dollars at the time still mm -hmm. and did basically nothing. It was everywhere. And then the next year it was nowhere. And I wonder if it's a strategic call on Apple's part to release it afterwards so that they can more tightly control like the market. what the publicity is going to be for it. Like if it comes out and it's like the Google Glass and it kind of does nothing and you have hundreds of thousands of people wearing it at these tech convent or tech expositions right away and you're showing off how useless it is, that's bad. But if you give it 11 months to cook for people to make things to use it for now that they've spent almost $4,000 on a glorified uh, meta quest. <laughs> I don't know. I see they're going the PlayStation 4. I mean, they, they, they're avoiding the PlayStation 5 strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do wonder, though, because like the big thing in the marketing, right, is yeah. that, you know, like you can see the eyes from the outside. I don't know if you've seen anybody who's like actually used that mode of it, but it looks like shit. Does it? Yeah. Let me see if I can find a quick screenshot of it. Um, MKBHD, Marcus Brownlee on YouTube, has a series of videos that he's published already um, because he was able to get uh, a unit early mm -hmm. just because he does a lot of uh, pre like previews and reviews with Apple products ahead of time and has a working business relation with them. Um, L M. Um, Marcus Brownlee. Uh, and uh, it's really interesting because he is very much, I don't want to say like uh, an evangelist because I think that's a far too uh, abrasive term, but he is looking at it from a very optimistic perspective, right? Okay. And even for him, there are obvious problems. And the having the marketing be so far off is very surprising for an Apple product. And it just looks really bad like here. So obviously there's problems with cameras and stuff, but this is more or less what it kind of looks like in reality. It kind of looks, like, it a looks shit like shit. Post. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, Partly because there's a gigantic piece of glass that smudges immediately when you breathe on it, which doesn't help. But it's also really fuzzy and really dim. So and something that I haven't seen anybody mention that but I've seen as I see more and more people actually use this is that because uh, the person using it is looking at a screen like an inch away from their face, their eyes aren't pointed in the right directions and they look cross eyed. Because they're look, they're focusing on something very close to them, which is causing their eyes to focus wide. Yeah, and then that translates to the screen in the front, and it looks like they're looking like around you <laughs> when they have it on. And then that's uh, exaggerated even more by the sort of like bug like visor that is being projected through. So I'm kind of a heavy breather. Yeah, and I'm not gonna lie. I immediately get anxiety looking at this because I feel like if I'm in a car or something like that with this on, oh yeah, some, some place where it's not well ventilated, this is going to fog immediately. I don't know. It's weird. It's such a uh, like. There's a reason that Apple doesn't call it a VR headset, right? They call it spatial computing. Yeah. And so as they want it to be, I do think that that is like genuinely what their hope for this product becomes. They don't want it to be a VR headset. They want it to be uh, a different way to interact with the existing Apple products you already have, right? It's basically a fancy additional it's not even an additional a, a, a fancy monitor replacement for your macbook and that's one use case that i've actually seen uh marquez in particular bring up is the idea that if you're on like a long flight because you're you know a tech reviewer and you're going place to place to place doing your job mm -hmm. 
if you're on a six hour flight sitting next to someone you don't know and you're editing a video that is of yourself, that can be kind of awkward. And this gives a way that you can do that because your MacBook screen is not showing at all when you're using it. You can be editing your your thing like normal and your screen is just, you know, not displayed at that point. Right. And yeah. the idea is that it gives you a little bit more privacy in that regard. Except for the fact that now you have this thing on your face that's not conspicuous at all <laughs> and won't draw any more extra attention to yourself. But in a world, right, in a world, five, ten years now down the future where this kind of technology would become more normalized, that's like a, a legitimate use case, right, of this is obscuring what I'm actually working on, either for my own privacy or for the privacy of the people that I'm working with, right? But I guess on the other hand, there's also probably better ways to do that as it stands already. My question is, what's the install base right now for this? Because like you mentioned, it's a peripheral mm -hmm. for your, like, your existing Apple devices, but like... Yep. Cool. I know Apple's kind of like a luxury cult, but yep. what, what's going to keep this thing selling, you know? Mm -hmm. More people have more fuck you money than you realize. Like, not, not you in particular, but people in general. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, okay, so here's a fun thing. We talk about the 1%, right? Mm -hmm. The 1% of 300 million people in the u.s is three million people okay yeah three million people who have fuck you money that they could just be like oh it's a three thousand five hundred dollar status symbol sure i'll keep it in the box and maybe i'll use it someday but i have it because i have the money to have it that's how i see it one day i'll be one of those fuck you people yeah and then I can say fuck you to the lowly plebs. That's how that works, right? I can't wait to stare a homeless man in the face with, through my Google, I know, my uh, Apple headset. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine that? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Beast cures 1,000 children's blindness by giving them all Apple headsets. Oh my god, I love the idea of that. <laughs> Okay, give it like yeah. a week. Give it a week from now, right? Mm. Someone is going to steal that joke I just made right there. It's going to be in like Probably. SNL. It's going to be in some late night show. Yeah. Got to copyright that joke real fucking fast. Yeah, but my understanding of this is that it does function uh, as its own device in a limited capacity, right? Um, because of the the form factor of it, it has to do all of the graphical processing on board. Okay. So even if you do hook it up to like a MacBook or something, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like just plugging in a monitor where the MacBook is still doing the processing. It is sending the data over and it's being processed by the headset itself. So there is like a potential argument, I think, that you could make <laughs> in very specific work cases, right? Where this could legitimately be a productivity tool. And that's the same kind of workplaces or work cases that these VR headsets, like kind of AR-ish, have been used already in industries, right? Mm -hmm. When you're doing 3D modeling and you want to see the thing you're modeling in, you know, a one-to-one -one scale. That can be interesting. And it gives you, apparently, uh, that's one of the things that the Apple headset is very good at, is maintaining the uh, sense of place, right? Where you put something into the world, the virtual world that your headset is uh, generating. And as you move around in the real world, the position of that thing that's locked virtually is incredibly effective and lifelike. It doesn't vibrate or wiggle around as the headset moves because that's a really common thing with uh, conventional VR headsets is that the tracking is you know two thousand five hundred dollars cheaper and it's not as good but they have made a way to either make that tracking better or hide the jitteriness right because it's like kind of thing where it's, it's like, like uh people don't realize how much they move right yeah mm -hmm. 
And it's only when you like watch GoPro footage that you get to see how much you're actually moving because your eyes help to hide that. So, you know, what were you going to say, though? Yeah. So um, when are they put, put, putting Pokemon Go on this? Mm -hmm. Probably never. Fuck <laughs> Nintendo. Because uh, a ton of app developers have made the decision to opt out of having their default, because it's iPad-based, I think is what it was, uh, iPad-based apps uh, ported over by default to the Vision Pro, including uh, the big ones that I heard were YouTube, Netflix, and HBO. Wow. And you can still access those through a web browser, but yeah, those are pretty big names to not have dedicated apps for. That's devastating. Mm-hmm. Because, like, if you had YouTube on here, this would at least have some a semblance of a decent install base. Right. That's the thing that I think a future version of this could be a compelling argument for, right? Yeah. As a toy, it makes no sense. As a work tool, it makes more sense, but is very niche. As something to work as both a very high-end monitor and a very high-end TV that you can use as you need to for your job, but not necessarily all the time, but then is also just an excellent TV screen, like a replacement, basically, I think the price starts to make more sense. And if you can set it up in a way where, like, say you can make this, like, a $2,000 version, right? Mm -hmm. Where you get rid of the inside-out tracking kind of stuff, or make it much, much more simplified, and just have this be a really good TV screen, I think you'd get a lot of people to buy it. Just being able to have that, like, 70-inch home theater experience wherever you can sit is a compelling prospect for a lot of people. I'm not going to lie, it sounds kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely loses some of the uh, social aspect that you could have with that right because you know if you want to watch with a bunch of people you all have to have one of these mm -hmm. at the same time but it also opens up some other ones i think one of the biggest things that has been missing from social medias in general is an easy way to do like a virtual watch party i've ran into this so many times across like at least three different like discord and discord like apps where i've tried to do like a watch party with people yeah and you know you want to watch a premiere or something releasing or uh, just watch a movie with people and you can make it work and you can still have a good time but it's not flawless and you get issues of things getting out of sync someone's especially if it's like a reveal party right yeah someone's like two seconds ahead of everybody else and relax reacting completely you know before we know what the hell's happening and it kind of takes you out of it pretty quickly Agreed. Something like this that can create a low latency virtual environment that everybody could be basically seeing at the same time offers a solution to that problem, potentially, in a hardware form. But it does still need the software to come along later. That's the problem I'm just facing with this, kind of like looking yeah. at it. Yeah. Um... I have to frame this as a monitor. Yes. Because like, I think that's correct. Augmented reality makes no sense for this. No. No. And Which it basically is, doesn't work. Yeah. It's a shame. Because mm -hmm. it'd be very cool. It would be very cool. I want more augmented reality technology. Yep. We kind of peaked with it with Pokemon Go and like the 3DS mm -hmm. capture cards that happened for a while. Mm hmm. And I don't know why we stopped fucking looking into it. And I'm so upset so, with the consumer technology market for that. It's because generally it sucks. <laughs> and that's kind of the reality. The, the PS Vita has some cool stuff too. Yeah. But making a game for it that exists beyond a tech demo is very difficult. I remember there was a, like a an old school Hanks game on uh, I don't know if it was on the Vita or the 3DS but one of them that did that where you could take like uh, soup cans and food boxes and put them on a table 
and mark what rough shapes and sizes they were. And you could play a game of like tanks versus a computer by moving in and around the real soup cans and stuff that you put on your table. That's charming. It's very neat yeah. for about like five minutes because it doesn't work very well. <laughs> and you have to hold your handheld console up above your table, pointed at it the whole time, which is not comfortable. I think that's ultimately the problem. I think the the you know, people want like a Tony Stark type AR glasses. Mm -hmm. And those are so far into the realm of science fiction that I would question if they're even possible from like a materials perspective, right? To I... put processor, screens, battery, and cameras into a thin form factor like that. I don't know if that's physically possible. I don't think so. I think uh, like you would... I think eventually we'll get a good facsimile of it. I'm a but, sorry. Yeah. No, it, I'm not convinced yet. I don't want to say never because there's so many like quotes of people being stupid about technology, but it seems incredibly far reached. My opinion is that we could get to that, but it would involve having to make something that's very unconsumer friendly. Cause like the way yeah. I think about it is like um, the first computers where they would essentially take up like a room. Yeah. Yeah. I think we could probably get there if we were willing to give up that much space, mm -hmm. but with the relationship we have with consumer technology, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Now fucking military stuff. I, I don't know. They've got all the fucking money. They're the scary ones. Yeah. I've also seen uh, some talk on the comfort side of it. That's been kind of interesting where they have their like one strap headband thing. That's very uh, visually interesting. Okay. Right. Yeah. But apparently is extremely uncomfortable for more than like 45 minutes. And it's like because of the way that it works, right, where it only goes around the back of your head, you have to really clamp it down on the front, which makes it press very tightly on your cheekbones and your forehead. Mm. And that gets uncomfortable. And Apple knows this because they include a more conventional VR headset style headband with the strap over the top in the box that works fine. But I do find it very fascinating that we're, you know, going back and forth with some of the videos that have been cropping up on social media, how every single time you see someone using it, they're using the very, you know, the headband, the single strap headband, mm -hmm. right? And I find that, you know, it's the Apple effect in general, where it's like, yes, people are inconveniencing themselves, apparently now to their own physical detriment because it looks cool. Yeah, dude. Not necessarily cool, but because it looks like it looks expensive. I wish we would and stay I find on that the... kind of fascinating. If we stay on the cool trend, it would be a perfect allegory for smoking. Kinda. Yeah. yeah. Allegory? I guess a metaphor is a better word for that. Mm -hmm. Regardless, this is a repeated pattern of, you know, people will do. I would love for there to turn out to be some sort of a vulnerability in these that turns up that isn't, like, particularly malicious or anything, right? Annoying? but that you could exploit to make the processors lag <laughs> and just like fuck with people. Oh, you've got your vision pro on and you're walking around outside. You know, you got 13 seconds of 13 milliseconds of latency. Let's, let's crank that up to 30. Oh no. You no know, 50, 70. Cause eventually they're going to start falling over. <laughs> and I would find that hilarious. Just to, like, you know, Despite kind of prank them. people by making the, you know, it's like the, the drunk goggles kind of thing. Yeah. Um, who was it? William Osmond with Tom Scott did that uh, with a car where they replaced the windshield with monitors and then delayed the monitor refreshing 
compared to cameras on top of the car so that you were like drag driving with lag in real life <laughs> and it was basically undrivable almost immediately but that it was sounds very really funny. scary yeah but if someone's just walking though then they just like fall over or stumble or i would be like whoa i gotta take my headset off like think about all of the the pe like old people playing a very chintzy vr video game for the first time and freaking out videos right yeah like I, I think that would be funny i would love to see like a 5k like that but then they have like um <laughs> all the runners just sporadically get the latency at different points and watch them all just a like 5k but at every kilometer it clicks up a percent or two yeah exactly that'd be very good oh that sounds like a murder yeah i talk about getting fogged up i don't want to imagine working out with one of these dude the, the video you showed me nasty. of like the guy at planet yeah. fitness no yeah never never because it's silicone yeah it's already gonna be kind of sweaty no but hey what what's new more bunches of people with more money than sense who would have guessed where have you been since 2016 yeah Speaking of since 2016, though, uh, God, so I can close that one. All right. Quick lightning round here, right? Oh, no. Okay. Before we get to the real news. Uh, news story from back in December that I think we were uh, on an off week when this, when this happened, so we didn't really talk about it, but it's come back around again as people are talking about it just again. The video is going around of uh, current... Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, uh, claiming to be, or sorry, claiming that God has prepared him to be a new Moses. Yeah. And uh, I want to read some of these quotes because uh, it's terrifying. Just like actual, what I would describe as likely schizophrenia. Delu like actual delusions of grandeur kind of shit. Uh, so let, let's just let's read through some of this. This is a quote from uh, Mike Johnson speaking at the uh, what was it National Association of Christian National Association of Christian Lawmakers uh, gala back in December, celebrating right wing Christian lawmakers. Uh, Speaker Mike Johnson thanked the event's organizers for kicking reporters out, which, you know, obviously didn't work because we have the entire quotes of his thing in the after aftermath of it, uh, said, uh, the Lord speaks to your heart and he has been speaking to me about this. And the Lord told me very clearly to prepare. Okay, prepare for what? I don't know. Quote, we're coming to a Red Sea moment. What does that mean, Lord? And then he goes on and he talks about how uh, he believed that the Lord was allowing him to be Aaron to Moses for the current waves of right wing con Christian conservative politicians. Aaron being Moses's brother uh, in the Hebrew Bible, um, aiding Moses with his journey. He goes on and he says, I worked to get Steve Scalise elected and then Jim Jordan and Tom Emmer. Thirteen people ran for the post. The Lord kept telling me to wait and I waited and waited and it came to the end and the Lord said, now step forward. Me, I'm supposed to be Aaron. So that is him pretty explicitly saying that in his mind, the Lord, like not in like a metaphorical way, in a literal way, spoke to him and told him to have his Red Sea moment and be a new Moses. I don't know. This sounds kind of beautiful, man. I'm, 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 mm -hmm. I'm willing to take his word on it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see how this could go possibly wrong. How long do you think it is until we get uh, Mormons 2, a.k.a. Christianity 3, a.k.a. Judaism 4? damn um you know honestly with the track record we're on mm -hmm. i'm calling before 2030 yeah i think i think that's like, i think that's a conservative estimate <laughs> here, here's my idea right mm -hmm. it's going to rely on who's the next president yeah 
it's going to depend on where the grift is after who whoever becomes the next president becomes the next president. Mm-hmm. Uh, where all the money is. Yep. And most importantly, how fast social media can like profitize a person. Yep. Oh, I think we're well past that point. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, because like, here's the thing: the idea of a new religion starting off the internet mm-hmm. and like being Christianity 3.0. morbidly curious about that Mm -hmm. just from like a media scholarship kind of idea Mm -hmm. endlessly fascinates me you have no idea how much i'm just like freaking out over that idea that you just put in my head but at the same time as someone who uh kind of is down with religion that scares the fuck out of me yeah as someone who has to live next to these people it is horrifying endlessly if we could like just contain them on an <laughs> island and do this i'd be down well, I for was, it <laughs> i was actually gonna say it starts to make you understand what happened that caused the mormons to get run out of the east coast and then run out of michigan yeah holy shit <laughs> so who would yeah. be the next prophet in, the, in this version right do we have like an, a name already in oh, mind yes we do okay scary version you know, the scary version? <laughs> yeah. Trump. 1,000%. I don't think he'll live that long, though. They are, they have already, there are already people claiming that he is Jesus, like, in a literal sense. Waiting on that heart attack any day now. Yeah. I, I say that your uh, 2030 estimate is too, too conservative because I would be shocked if regardless of how this election goes, if it takes longer than 2020, which is the next election, um, either Biden gets reelected yeah. and they lose their fucking minds and keep trucking along this path or Biden doesn't get elected and they have to figure out the whole two terms problem thing because they've elevated their president to literal religious icon status now. Mm -hmm. And you can't not have the president or you can't not have Jesus be the president, right? (laughs) Just that is a clear, when you're a a national Christian conservative, that is, uh, what would be the word for it? Like anti theological, I don't know. There's probably a, a a more appropriate terminology for it, but it's like goes in direct contrast with your fundamental beliefs of creating, like you're creating a Christian nation, and Jesus isn't the head of that Christian nation. What's going on? Quite so funny. yeah, yeah. Twenty twenty eight. Twenty twenty eight. If is it's going to happen, it's going to happen by then. Okay. And I think that's mostly because we're already seeing it happening now. I have to say we're already seeing it happening now. I just feel like the framework isn't going to be that fast because like, well, they uh, just hijack Christianity. It's not that easy. Yeah, it is. It's happened like five times. (laughs) Does this end up with Baron Trump being like the Pope? I don't think so. For for everything that's happened, Baron seems like he just doesn't want to be involved with it. And I can appreciate that. (laughs) Baron, I know you're listening to the show right now. Yeah, I know we're your favorite listener. podcast. We're on your team. <laughs> Stay away. Yeah. Follow your aunt. Yes, please do. You seem like, you know, as as well adjusted as somebody who is the son of not just the president, but a religious zealot. You seem about as well adjusted as it could be. What if the fact the... that I'm not hearing about you ever, you're doing something right. Keep doing that. What if the Pope like were to call a crusade against Trumpism? <sighs> that not gonna happen. Not Francis. No. But like not not Francis, but I don't know. I'm sorry, you just got like all these gears moving in my head now with the history of religion and like how yeah. every time a new religion is introduced it never goes well. And we were talking about it with the Michigan Republican Party, but we're due for a good schism. 
we are a good <laughs> it's just sad you know we're too young to be dealing with this bullshit yeah uh, born too late to explore the world born too early to explore the stars born just in time to see a new christian nationalist religious organization formed and completely ruin everything that came before it damn dude this is like no that's a bad I, example yeah go I, on. I will say though I, I do think if it goes that way and i i if it's it's tricky right it's like I'm oh saying... what about x well no we're already we're already past that point it's like well what if trump comes out and like does the heinous acts that are in direct defiance of their faith surely that would snap some of these people from their senses and not continue down the path that they have picked but like no we know that that's not the case because we're living through that reality right now and you know we live in the reality where the guy gets put on civil trial for raping a woman is found to have uh, done so to an extent that he is legally culpable for damages resulted from saying that that didn't happen. And that did not have a significant impact in either direction on the man's popularity. Do you think like, if it would have happened? That's the world we live in. If it would have passed happened, the event horizon. <laughs> if it would have happened before presidency, do you think it would have impacted his popularity? I'm sorry, the the grab them by the pussy guy? <sighs> no. Because we're past that. You made me forget about that. I can't believe right. I that, that, that yeah. that's what I'm that's what I'm having in real time though as well. It's like, well no, but what if it happened this way or that way? But we're past that already. The simple fact is no one cares. Like the we're at the point where I legitimately think, right? Think back to pre twenty sixteen. Mm-hmm. Trump's shoot shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and get away with it comment, right? Yeah. We're at the point now where I believe that's the case. Or maybe that's not the case, but I believe that the people following him believe that's the case. That he could shoot someone and it'd be like, oh, well, they were the devil. And it's just, that's fine now. Well, that's all right then. Like, that's where we're at. And I wish that was like hyperbole in any way, but it's just not. That's just the reality of how fucked up our political climate is. I don't even think it's a political climate at this point. Because, like, what the fuck does politics well, have social to do with climate, it? then. Yes. There yeah. you go. Where you can have a prominent member of society come out and with no irony or sarcasm in complete seriousness say that God is talking to them directly and telling them how to pursue their political aspirations. And that's not questioned by the people following them. No. Because questioning that stuff is too hard. Yep. Makes you really feel for the position that Biden is in right now, you know? We had a, a, a quote come out so I can find it real quick. Or apparently, uh, behind closed doors, Biden referred to Trump as a sick fuck. You know, who knows how accurate the reporting is, but, you know, I think most people would agree. Or most people who, like, most people who would ever agree, pretty much in agreement at this point. But now you have to go out there again as Biden and potentially campaign against that for a second time. That must be so just demoralizing that this is the position that we're in. Do you think Biden even realistically wanted to do a second term? Because I'm of the opinion he probably he didn't want to do a first term. Yeah. He, he, he talked about this openly where uh, in 2016, he wanted to run, but his son died. And he could not, which is completely understandable. And come 2020, he's said that he basically he did not want to and he does not want to, but he doesn't think that in good conscience he cannot. 
given the state of everything. And I am unfortunately uh kind of in agreement. It's like it's a social like neurosis that we have to play this two person game. And like the idea of a third like a newer vo- person being in there is just too risky of an election. Yeah. Yeah, I would love for anyone other than Biden to come up and like be a Democratic nominee, but they just don't exist right now. No, because there's it's... names thrown around, but none of them have come even close to being a serious contender. And that's part of the problem. We have very complacent politicians. Mm-hmm. Realistically, like. Do you think, like, uh, let, let, let's put the scenario, right? Mm-hmm. In nine months' time, when we have the election, it's Biden and Trump. More than likely. Yeah, almost, almost certainly, yes. yes. Do you think... Barring, barring yeah. uh, you know, we're, we're going to have a Supreme Court decision here very soon, right? And that'll be the only inflection point that I can imagine is going to happen. Either the Supreme Court says... Trump can be on the ballots, yep. and he is, and he wins the Republican nomination. Or the Supreme Court says Trump cannot be on the ballots, and he doesn't. Yes. But, hear me out, right? Yeah. Assuming one of those fuckers gets elected. Yep. At this point in their game and in their advanced ages, and this is doubly so probably for Biden at this point, because he's probably mm-hmm. not taking like rhino tranquilizer to like get past the pain he's in, like Trump is. Uh, do you honestly think they would survive another term just from stress alone? Like, Oh, uh, survive. Yes. Okay. Do it with full, you know, a hundred percent of their faculties. No, no, I, I don't think so either. That's what scares me a <laughs> lot about these two. You know, like we saw how far, who, who the hell was it? Uh, California Senator, um, not, not Warren. No, the 93 um, year old lady. Feinstein. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we saw how fast, right, she passed away. Mm -hmm. They can keep these people, you know, weekended at Bernie's for years. Practically, it seems. Just keep them pumped up with enough drugs. Okay, so assume Biden wins. Do you think Trump is going to come in 2028? I would be shocked if Trump lives that long. Yeah, I don't think genuinely as much uh, judicial pressure is on him right now. Another he he is not staying out of jail for another four years, pure and simple, Mm -hmm. whether it's New York or Georgia or if it actually is the federal courts, there's no way he makes it another four years. You know, even Eileen fucking Cannon down in Florida can't stall for that long because all the wheels are moving already. And the fact that the the specter of Trump being charged criminally is looming in the current year already seems pretty uh, definitive in that regard. That no, I I think he will probably uh, end up in jail in some capacity. And hey, here's here's my long shot, my hot not hot take, but my uh, you know. Seeing through the future perspective, right? Yeah. I would bet 2026, assuming he doesn't get reelected and pardon himself of everything. Because that's what happens if he does get elected, of course. Assuming he doesn't get elected, Biden remains the president. 2026 is when uh, the current cases that are criminal will have about concluded and had rulings given. And if any jail time is to be served, jail time would start around then. And I would say by the end of 2026, not before March of 2027, he would probably die in jail. Yeah. Just out of uh, mental decline and depression at that point, I think. As someone who is as rampant of a narcissist as he is, even in a cushy white collar jail, I don't think he'll last. No, because 
there's no way in hell he's not being kept running by some amount of a cocktail of drugs that jail would not allow for. <laughs> and I think it'll break him fairly quickly. So, yeah, that's my guess. Okay. So assuming everything continues on the path that it is, Biden wins re-election. End of 2026 is my guess. Where do we'll you see. see the election going between the two of them? Because I'm of the opinion we already dumped him <sighs> once. It's not likely we're going to bring him back again. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We'll have to see how it goes. Um, the. Uh, I I would be shocked if it's significantly different. They're trying to censor us. Chiral. He's gone, ladies and gentlemen. Let's see if I reconnect the call, if he'll come back. Or like... There we go. Texas, like, actually secedes. So, heads up, you just got censored by the government. And I just got <laughs> you back. Like at okay. the very did beginning of that. The, the, did you see the Air, the Arizona bit? No, you're about to start okay. right I'll, from the I'll beginning of my question. Then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, Arizona lawmakers are trying to currently pass a law and it probably won't succeed because, you know, a, you know, a large enough people are not completely fucking insane that live down there. Right. Mm -hmm. But they currently have a, a law that is being debated on uh, that would attempt to make the Arizona popular vote as it relates to federal elections irrelevant and that i don't know if it's the governor or the congress chooses the electors to go to congress to represent arizona but it completely disregards the popular vote is the bigger point barring that or like a number of states secede from the union like texas is posturing to and probably won't it'd be stupid of them too but you know there's yeah. lots of stupid people there barring something dramatic like that i can't see it going in any different way the people who voted like that and the, that's the key thing is like the number of people who voted not for biden but against trump are still there and i don't think their opinions have been changed either way that's the big thing that we've been seeing as more and more of these you know verdicts come down is that the people who don't like the guy still don't like the guy kind of hard to win them over at this point yeah yeah I think if by some long shot, someone like Nikki Haley manages to get on the bill. Okay. Well, maybe not Nikki Haley because, you know, unfortunately for her, she's a woman and it impossibly seems like the number of like, as a percent, more people in the U S hate the idea of a woman being in a position of power more than they hate the idea of Trump being in a position of power. That's fucked up. It's very fucked up. But somehow that still seems to be the position that we're in today. But um, <laughs> if literally anybody else managed to get their name on the ballot instead of Trump, I think they'd have a fair shot of beating Biden just because uh, Republican uh, media has run a pretty effective smear campaign against the guy. Yeah, no, I think it's honestly kind of impressive because I thought their positions against Biden were pretty weak at first. Yeah. Oh, they are. Yeah. No, they have absolutely no substance, but uh, it just goes to show that if you say the same thing loud enough and frequent enough, it doesn't matter. Re repetition legitimizes. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's a good of a way to transition into our next bit here. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about the U.S. response to uh, Houthi strikes against uh, American military personnel. Uh, American shipping vessels and the attacks uh, on a U.S. military base in Jordan from Syria that resulted in the death of three Army Reserve soldiers. Oh, yeah. We talked about this last week mm -hmm. and, you know, perspective uh, responses that we might see as a consequence of this, because at that point, the White House had basically said, we're going to respond, but they hadn't said how yet. And the how mattered a lot, right? There's a lot of different uh, ways that they could choose to respond. And 
uh, what we've talked about then was that regardless of what happens, um, it's going to get spun in a bad way for Biden because yeah. there is no good way, right? You do nothing, you get painted as weak, you do too much, you get painted as a warmonger, as an aggressor. Uh, and while I do think that uh, they have probably correctly erred on the side of uh, appearing more warmongering than some would like, uh, I do have to respect the administration for their handling of it, because I think they've handled it about as effectively as they can between uh, discouraging future attacks as best as possible, issuing some very strong responses uh, verbally, and not going overboard with it. An, an effective display of military might, right? That's like all we have, dude. Pretty much. Uh, so, this week, the U.S. launched uh, two rounds of airstrikes. The first, uh, back on Friday, I believe it was, uh, hitting seven locations with 85 specific targets within those locations in Iraq and Syria. And today, a joint attack between the U.S. and the U.K., specifically targeting the Houthi uh, terrorists in Yemen that have been an ongoing nuisance for trade in the region. Um, according to Iraqi and Syrian governments, nearly 40 people have been killed as a result of the U.S. strikes in their regions. Uh, the U.S.-U.K. joint strike for earlier today is still very much developing, but uh, notably for the strikes in Iraq and Syria, uh, the U.S. government didn't even, like, telegraph. From what I understand, they pretty much just said exactly what they were targeting ahead of time <laughs> and gave the people at those sites, in contrast, you know, plenty of time to evacuate ahead of time. Uh, Iraq and Syria are claiming that a number of the casualties are civilians. That has yet to be confirmed, but wouldn't be too surprising, um, given just, you know, the nature of these kinds of things. But, uh, in con uh, what's the word? Uh, coordination with the physical strikes, uh, Biden, through the White House, issued uh, the following statement. Uh, Our response began today. It will continue at times and places of our choosing. The United States does not seek uh, does not seek conflict in the Middle East or anywhere else in the world. But let all those who might seek to do us harm know this: if you harm an American, we will respond. God damn, goes pretty hard. Yeah, no, that and is uh, you know, cool as it is from like a hell yeah rah 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 go America kind of thing. Yeah, is also a statement worth uh. Uh, criticizing because it's not true. <laughs> um, plenty of instances in the last couple of years of Americans being harmed abroad and the U S not really responding. Um, but as, uh, uh, you know, in coordination with the military tax, the statement of it is pretty clear when they say, you know, when you harm an American, they pretty clearly mean like, you know, American military yeah. is the, the implication there. So, yeah, it's, uh, sure is a thing. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. Uh, they have confirmed the, you know, being the, they being the White House, that they fully intend to, uh, launch further strikes, uh, over the next, you know, I say period of time because they haven't said when or where yet, but they made it very clear that this is not the end of it. It's not a one and done. Uh, Iraq and Syria are, uh, you know, understandably, if, you know, not surprisingly, uh, very unhappy with this happening, even though, like, you know, you gave the terrorists the weapons that they used to attack the United States. So what did you expect kind of thing? But, you know, they're not going to sit there and be like, yeah, we deserve that one. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that's how it is. Sometimes it just be like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
sometimes you just got to take the L. Um, I was reading some statements from uh, American military leadership, I guess would be the way to put it, because I don't remember the exact uh, names and ranks or whatever, that were saying the strikes uh, were being considered successes by them, as they were seeing in many of them uh, the secondary explosions that are indicative of strikes on uh, ammunition or mm -hmm. fuel depots, which were their main targets, you know, to not necessarily... Uh, go after individuals, but uh, resources, right? Yeah. And it seems in that regard, it was relatively a success. So, would, we got a little bit of time here left. Would you like to go through some films that came out this week? Oh my God, wouldn't I? You want to start with uh, what you saw, and then we can go into new releases, because there's only two of them, and it's probably not going to take too, too long. Bradley Cooper did Jewface and somehow got an Oscar nom. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's awkward. I don't understand the hype behind Maestro. I'm saying this as a Bernstein, Bernstein fan, and mm -hmm. um, this movie just ain't good. It yeah. is... Like it checks the boxes for like what good movies are supposed to have, but it just doesn't do it good. Like the movie is a biopic kind of retrospective on the relationship of Leonard Bernstein and his wife. Um, Bernstein uh, had a little bit of a in the closet situation where he was wanting to explore things with men and his wife gave him the green pass, the green card to go do that hall pass. Um, and it is about pretty much that. I'm not going to lie. I remember very little of this movie, even though I can remember like a couple of good shots. The cinematography is pretty okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Bradley Cooper is in it. He plays Bernstein and they make him wear this weird prosthetic. And I'm not going to lie. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I was showing Cairo a couple photos of it. What did you think of the, the prosthetic, Mr. Cairo? It's very uncanny. Yeah. I I get why they did it, but... <laughs> oh, it's very funny. Uh, there's a whole uh, section on Wikipedia just titled, Use of Prosthetic. Um, I don't know. I get why they did it. It seems kind of unnecessary. I kind of agree. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think Bradley Cooper would have been a good Bernstein. And I don't think he should have been casted as Bernstein. I don't know why Bradley Cooper cast himself in this movie. Yeah. Uh, it had Spielberg and Scorsese produce it, which there's a couple more of those boxes for you to check off. Um, and it's a film about music by the guy who did A Star is Born, another movie that I didn't think was that great. I have to wonder how much of it is related to, uh, like, industry ties, right? Yeah. Because while I could see nominations for, you know, some aspects of it, for a movie that didn't release that long ago and was reviewed at the time as being like solidly in like the eighties, right? Mm -hmm. It's weird for it to get a best picture nomination. I just don't understand why Maestro is around. It's like one of those movies that it could have been something. It should have been something, but it's just there. I did not feel a single thing watching this movie. There's one performance in this film that Bradley Cooper does. I, mean, I, I believe it is why he decided to do this movie. Uh, it's a scene of Bernstein conducting. Mm -hmm. And it's, so all credit, very well done. However, it doesn't make the whole film worth it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Here's something I'm wondering on, and I'd have to look back for them to see this. I don't remember the Academy Awards having so many nominations for Best Picture in the past. Maybe I'm misremembering, but there's 10 this year. There shouldn't be 
not at the the stage of you know the nominees being announced you shouldn't still have 10 people nominated 10 films nominated that feels like padding to me i agree it feels more like someone pulling favors to market these movies i don't think not all movies are created equal and with yep. that not all oscar noms are should have been nominated We never touched on the Oscars, didn't we? No, it kind of skimmed by. Eh. We got time, though. It's not so March. Yeah. We'll get there eventually. Maybe. <laughs> uh, regardless, it is a movie with very bad writing. Yep. Um, I, I guess it's not bad writing. It's passable writing. However, yep. Maestro struggles to make any kind of impression through its writing. There's mm -hmm. one scene that's kind of funny. Which um, he and his wife are having a fight on Thanksgiving, and they're in downtown New York. So after their fight is over, you kind of see the Macy's Thanksgiving parade in the background, which is cute. Interesting. Yeah, it, that that's pretty much it. Uh, overall, uh, it feels like I don't know. It felt like this should have been better. Bernstein's like mm -hmm. an American musical icon. Yeah. And all he I took away from this movie was, I'm afraid Bradley Cooper is going to come eat me in my sleep in that terrifying prosthetic. Yeah, it's a, certainly a choice. I feel like the fact that it gets its own Wikipedia entry is telling. Yeah, I think so. Oh, well. No, apparently... Uh, just as a note, Bernstein's children have defended Cooper's use of prosthetic makeup, stating that they worked with Cooper throughout the filmmaking process and that, quote, their dad would have been fine with it. I'm sure he would have, so, you know. Yeah, but it is still kind of awkward. It's awkward. Yeah. I wouldn't say, like, it's something that's worth canceling, but it should yep. have been, like, more thought put into it. Uh, maybe find an actor that looks more like Bernstein in the first place. Bernstein is just like a normal looking dude. And then you have model Bradley Cooper. You know, he was busy already, but do you know who Bernstein looks like to me? Who? Robert De Niro. Yo. He was doing Killers of the Flower Moon, so that doesn't work. But the hair and, and the wrinkle lines, especially. It's just like, yeah. He, he's got like a more rounded face, but you're right. Oh, that would have been cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we will definitely have to go through the Academy Awards because there's some interesting things to go over here. Um, I'm picking up a couple of things that I think we could definitely uh, make some conversation about. But something that stood out to me, uh, calling back to earlier in the show, uh, Coleman Domingo has a Best Actor nomination. Oh, hell yeah. For Rustin. Never heard of it. Neither have but... I. Uh, yeah. He must have done pretty good in it. He plays the lead. Um, uh, reception? 85% on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't remember hearing about it. For our new releases, though, we have really just two. Um, one that I don't know if you've heard about, uh, but it has Mad Mickelson as the lead. Uh, The Promised Land. Seems to be doing quite well. Uh, 18th century Danish film. In Danish. So we'll see how much of a wide release it ends up getting. But uh, I am always very interested whenever there is uh, an actor as well known as someone like Mads Mikkelsen doing mm -hmm. a film in their native language. I think that's very cool. That's like purely doing it for the craft of it because you know it's not going to get a wide release uh otherwise there's really only one thing that's coming out this weekend and that's argyle argyle has have... cool vi like imagery yeah. to it but i know nothing about it so it is being directed by 
the same person, Matthew Vaughn, who did the Kingsman films. Okay. Um, all of them. As well as what was the rest of it? There's something else. Uh, Kick Ass. And what's the other one here? Uh, Silent Night hmm. and Tetris. But those aren't producer roles. As a director, though, yeah. Uh, he, he definitely has a distinct visual style in his direction that comes through here. Uh, very reminiscent of the use in color and camera that was in The Kingsman. Um, from what I've seen in reviews of this, it is also very similar in the action forwardness of it being an action movie. And it's got a pretty stacked cast, which I didn't really realize because they don't show much of it in the trailers. I'm not going to lie. I was looking over the cast and I felt like I was watching, like looking at a Knives Out movie. Yeah. So One criticism that I did see of it yeah. is that because it has such a stacked cast, apparently the film is uh, pretty reluctant to actually kill anyone off because they want to bring these people back for a sequel. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Too bad it doesn't look like we'll, we'll get a sequel. I don't know. It's I, I'm i surprised to see that the critical reception is as low as it is. I didn't expect it to be like a masterpiece or anything. But yeah. the individual reviews that I've seen of it describe it more as uh, not great, but still fun. So, a bit surprising, especially when you have, like, what's the other one? The Beekeeper at 70%. It feels like people are... These movies are much closer than uh, the reviews that I've seen have seemed to paint them, in my perspective. Looking at, like, the content of the reviews compared to the numbers they actually give. It's kind of fascinating. John Cena crops up again. John Cena is like in everything nowadays. Yeah. How many movies? Don't take a guess. How many movies does he star in in 2023? Just 2023. More than me. Um, I'm so going to we'll go with a here. cool 38. Oh, no. It's not nearly that much. Okay. Number of movies he was in in 2023. Number of them that actually had a positive more positive than negative review uh he was in six films last year freelance vacation friends 2 uh he had a character in teenage mutant ninja turtles mutant mayhem hidden strike barbie and fast x and of those only barbie and teenage mutant ninja turtles which he had very much side characters in um or no sorry teenage mutant ninja turtles he was not a side character he was one of the villains i believe yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But still, Barbie, he's like a cameo, basically. Uh, all the rest are under 50 or under 60%. They're uh, marked as rotten on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> it's kind of fascinating because that's like the case of a lot of his uh, filmography where he gets like one or two good things that pop up, but the rest of it is like. Fast X. Yeah. That's what I got. Anything else you had in mind? No, it's been a pretty slow week, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. We did have some uh, magical gathering controversies crop up. Oh, please go um, on. I love hearing about how nerds have tried to cheat at their own game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not quite in that. Well, there was also that. Um, but no, with the uh, Wizards of the Coast side of things. Um, oh, no. <laughs> they have started to transition their secret layer system from print to demand to pre-printed only. So there's now... Uh, where if, as long as you ordered one within the 30 day window that they were available to be ordered, you would be guaranteed to get one. Whereas now they're pre-printing a set number of them. And if they sell out, they're done. That's scary. A little bit. 
<laughs> and it was super unfortunate, not, not unfortunate, bad planning on their part, where the first uh, product that they had under the Secret Lair branding that is not at all impacted by that change, uh, it follows the same trend as past uh, Secret Lair full commander decks that they've sold, where those have always been a pre-printed number ahead of time. Um, because they did the first one print to order and they ran into uh, production problems and it got delayed by like two years. So they started just pre-printing them ahead of time to just avoid that entirely. And it sold out in like six hours. Of course Which it is. <laughs> not a good look. No. It wasn't at all impacted by the changes that they're making, but it is very poor planning on their part. We did get an actual, like, cheating allegation this week, though, that has largely been, at this point, uh, determined to have not been cheating. It is, it is, you know, it's the kind of thing where it's like, the person probably wasn't trying to cheat. If they were, what they did didn't impact that game. But it's still bad practice, and the judges there should have caught it and done something about it, where... Uh, it was in a modern tournament, I believe. They were uh, searching their library for a land card, and as they were doing that, they uh, very intentionally pulled a non-land card up as like a, oh, I have this in my deck kind of thing, and pulled it out of the deck from the rest of their cards, mm -hmm. put it on the top of their deck, and then started shuffling. And as they're shuffling, they it is very questionable as to whether or not they shuffled adequately enough that their act of intentionally putting that card on the top effectively randomized it back into the deck afterwards. And their opponent cut their deck after, so it didn't really matter. Yeah. But it's the kind of thing where it's like, if the judge sees that, they should be saying something about it, and it didn't happen. And there's been discord discourse back and forth from people on both sides, of people who are just like, yeah, that shouldn't be happening, because even if this person didn't mean to do that, other people could definitely do that maliciously, trying to gain an advantage, however slight. You know, even if it gets caught by your opponent, nine times out of ten, they're like, hey, you gotta shuffle better, you can't do that. If you're getting your best card on top of your deck one times out of ten, that's pretty good odds. So, yeah. Good old cheating allegations. This is why I can't play competitive magic. I don't know how to cheat. It's thankfully pretty uncommon, but uh, it does suck when it happens, especially when it happens at a high profile level. You know, the, the thing I, I, I like magic as a community. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I like the magic uh, community when it never takes itself that seriously. Mm -hmm. But I'm always very afraid of the competitive community. <laughs> It is a bit of a shame where the competitive side of it has gotten. Um, Wizards of the Coast made some pretty bad decisions on how to manage it, and COVID didn't help. But looking back at like the 2016-ish time period, mm -hmm. they are doing some really cool stuff with the competitive side of things. Where even if you weren't playing it, it was still just cool to watch these people play at a really high level and just make good plays. It's always fun. Didn't Karloff Manor have its pre-release this weekend? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess we can talk about that. I went to go to it on Friday, and they ran out of seats. Oh. So I had to just take my... I still bought a kit and just, you know, took it home. But, yeah. I'm so sorry. First time I've ever seen that happen. So I'm interested in Karloff Manor because this is a magic mm -hmm. set based off murder mysteries. And anybody who knows me at the moment, I'm kind of fucking with murder mysteries a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, my job lets us get stuff with like good boy and girl, good uh, good girl points. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, I managed to get myself uh, some Agatha Christie novels. That's how much nice. of a phase I'm going through right now. So what, I would say, yes. I highly recommend uh, reading the magic story that they put out for Murders of Carlet Manor. I've not finished it yet, but from what I've seen, it is uh, quite good. They've been doing a really good job with the story lately. It's not, you know, to the same highs that it has been in the past, but 
It's good stuff. Good short stories. I don't know. Did and there's like that? an actual murder mystery to be told, which is kind of fun. Did you see that Doctor Who set they came out? The story they came out with the Doctor Who set? They made like a whole 13 season television show just to explain the lore <laughs> behind the cards. <laughs> I'm sorry. 60 years of television. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy dedication. They were prepping this for a fucking while. <laughs> Dude, they got David Tennant involved. Anything else you would like to bring up for the show? I don't believe so. That's perfect. That's uh, all I got. I have a one small little rant I would like to go on. Please. Have you ever tried buying running shoes? Not in a while. Running shoes are a godless market. Have you ever been in a dick sporting good lately? <laughs> no. So I went there yesterday trying to get myself some good running shoes. Mm -hmm. So I've been running for like maybe a year and a half now, but I've always been using uh, Walmart. I'm sorry, not Walmart. Meyer brand like running shoes. And it's kind of been hurting my feet a lot lately because those aren't really, like, good for, like, good running. To give, like, an idea, I do, like, 5Ks when I run. Uh, so my feet feel like they're about to fall off. So I decided enough is enough. I should probably get some proper running shoes. Dick's Sporting Goods has a nice little area uh, for running shoes. Would you care to know what the median price was there? Oh, God, I have no idea. Was it over or under $100? Over. Jesus. Yeah, I would I would not have gotten that correct. <laughs> For a pair of shoes, I'm going to stomp through. That's I, wild. I do not know, like, the actual, like, metrics of how long these shoes last. But yep. when my girlfriend and I went to Dick's last night, <laughs> well, not... You know, when we went to Richard's Sporting Good Outlet. Richard's. Yeah, I'm going to call them out by their government name. No dicks. You will when not your dick me around your full today. name. <laughs> so Richard's Sporting Goods Outlet. Uh, I come in. I find the shoes pretty easily. Um, the medium price there was like 130 bucks for a pair of shoes. That's absurd. Isn't it? And this is the other weird part. They have like a giant like little banner that says like running on it. But they also have them right next to like the basketball shoes and like the other sports shoes. Yep. The only shoes that they really separate from like the, the vast majority of them are the golf shoes. Maybe because those are, are like, you know, a little more spiky, I suppose. Yeah. So I'm going into Dick Sporting Goods. Trying to find me a nice, cheap pair of running shoes so I can't die on my run. Um, so I come in there, and there are shoes all the way up to 180 bucks staring me in the face. Yep. Godless, I tell you. Uh, and then I find out, uh, as I'm like going through, they have them like spaced out that they get a little cheaper as you go like a certain direction. By the time I get to like the certain direction... Uh, I'm unknowingly looking at basketball shoes. And all this to say, I didn't even know if I was looking at run di long distance running shoes or like short mm -hmm. distance running shoes. The, the running shoe market is designed to confuse someone and to oversell these shoes. It's unfair. And I'm on Dick's Sporting Goods website right now. Would you care to guess the, the, the shoe I'm looking at? It's a Nike's Men Vaporfly 3 running shoes. Jeez. I, I genuinely have no idea. I've been lucky to not have to buy any shoes for a little while now, and I'm <laughs> dreading having to go and do it because I know it's going to be absurd after, you know, inflation. Yeah. You want to know how inflated these prices are? How much? Deviant art levels of inflation. <laughs> $269.99. Jeez. God, that's pretty absurd. This is absurd. N needless to say, I've been doing my research now to see if I can get a decent pair of running shoes where I don't have to break bank. Uh, 
that's my it's rant. gotten to the point where i bought last time i bought shoes yeah i found a pair of actual leather like not like full boots but like half boots yeah on sale and i needed something with a leather outer for at work for chemical spills and all that so i got those and it's like everything is just so expensive that i'm legitimately considering trying to find like a uh a, a, a furrier a shoemaker, a fucking cobbler <laughs> to fix the stitches that have burst and put a new tread on it rather than buy a new shoe because it's probably going to cost about the same. You know, I like to blame this all on those fucking assholes who collect sneakers. I don't know. For the Nike stuff, there's probably some truth to it, but I think a lot of it is also just greedy, greedy companies. They know they can get away with it, so they do. Like, I, I, I should retract that a little bit. I understand the hype behind sneaker collecting because I'm not going to lie. I kind of think shoes are cool, mm. but I would never, never collect sneakers just from how yeah. expensive they are. No, I, I agree for sure. Did you see there's a video going around this week of some people who claim to be like barefoot evangelists that were cutting the bottoms out of their shoes so that they could walk around barefoot while having it look like they were wearing shoes still. Yeah, I did see that. What freaks? Some wild shit. Seriously. You know, I thought I could get away with this because we're technically in winter right now. Mm -hmm. Like, we're going through a little bit of a Michigan fall spring right now. But no, yeah. I thought running shoes would be on sale because they need to liquidate stuff because the fiscal year's starting. Nope. We are living in the worst timeline. And it this, sure feels like it. And this is how running shoes turned me into a communist. <laughs> Anything you would like to add to the show, Mr. Cairo? That's all I got. Okay. Well, that's all, folks. <laughs>